right. Thank you so so much. It's a great pleasure to be back at the LSE. I've uh, spent many hours in this room <laughs> over the years, and that's because I had all kinds of affiliations. Um, <laughs> so it's, um, it's a great pleasure to, to be back, and particularly a pleasure to be speaking here with so many friends in the audience and about Hank's book, which I know very well because I had to read very carefully because I had to review it for Oxford University. Now you say. And I. Obviously, not very highly of it. <laughs> um, and so there's lots of things about Hank's work on understanding that I think have um, been really inspirational and help us all think um, more coherently and more deeply about understanding. I think his work has been really critical in advancing some of the main tenets about understanding that most of us take for granted today. The non-factivity of understanding, for instance, I think a lot of us think that a good theory, a count of understanding has to allow for non-factive understanding. That wasn't so clearly the case when he started working on the topic 15, 20 years ago. It wasn't so generally assumed to be the case. Also, the contextuality and all the contextual elements that come to bear into a good understanding, scientific understanding of a phenomenon. I think Hank has, has done a lot of really good work in getting us to accept that, again, something that, say, 15, 20 years, 20 years ago, he said today, 20 years to the day he started uh, on this project, I don't think that was generally accepted. So he's really done a tremendous amount of work in moving the field forwards in ways that I certainly feel are great and I'm totally on board with uh, of all of these developments. And as I was reading the book and the wonderful case studies that inspiring and wonderful, I was getting more and more convinced about all this. Um, all these uh, different um, um, features of his account. But I'm not going to talk about all the features of the account that I love so much. I'm going to fix <laughs> on the one feature of the account that I, I like to think we, we may want to move even farther, even farther forward and, and go even more contextualist, even more pragmatist, and I would argue even more deflationist um, on, on this account. And that's the notion that understanding and this small this morning this early afternoon that was um, that was already pointed out by christoph um, in his talk the notion that understanding somehow always relies or depends on on theories and so i'd like to push hank a little bit like christoph did this morning in maybe seeing whether we can move even farther along the contextualist um, pragmatist um, uh, road and and accept that perhaps there are cases in which we have good scientific understanding without having a coherent theory in the background that we can rely on, just as Christoph was suggesting earlier on. Although, as you will see, I also di I disagree with Christoph. Perhaps I even disagree more with Christoph. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll direct my criticism at Christoph because I'm so <laughs> that I doesn't, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so um, I'm, I'm not on board with the idea that degrees of understanding have much to do with representational accuracy, the way that I think Christoph wants to understand that. So I want to say, um, if we're going to understand degrees of understanding, if we're going to accept that there are degrees of understanding, we better have a more deflationary contextualist approach that gives us a sense of, of how there could be such degrees. So let me quickly run through what I want to do very quickly here. Um, since I, I want to present an account of understanding that, that links it essentially to representation and to representing activities in particular. So I'm going to have to have the, my useful detour through um, accounts of representation in order to fix terminology a little bit. And that will just invite uh, all the other comments that I will <coughs> go on to do about understanding, which very much rely on this understanding of representation. So, um, so the one thing that I found problematic in Christoph's talk earlier today was this idea that there is something like representational accuracy, which is a sort of similarity. I mean, he mentioned a bunch of different possible accounts of this, but all of them involve some kind of degree of matching between source and targets. And um, as you know, I don't think um, the thinking about scientific representation along those terms is going to be very productive. And so I want to link my account of understanding to a different, con more contextualized, more deflationary account of representation. So let me quickly run through 
the arguments for why we need a more face with contextualist pragmatist kind of representation. Some of you know um, these arguments very well. And think about different cases of scientific models. Some of them have come up already here. Some of them are canvas in Hink's book with great detail. Um, you can have concrete physical models, say a system of poles representing the planetary system and planetary motion. We give this to our kids and let them run this um, uh, mechanical pole system in order to figure out how the planets move. Um, that's a kind of very concrete kind of representation of a physical system and maybe also the motion, the phenomenon of physical motion of the planets. Um, but then there are more abstract kinds of models in, in science, an analogical model in which we just present a conceptual analogy, such as, for instance, the kinetic theory of gas, which is so stupendously studied by Henk in his book, a really wonderful treatment of this theory. Um, the kinetic theory of gas, which um, lays down an analogy between the gas molecules and billiard balls, this so-called billiard ball model of gases, and it has been studied in the philosophical literature at length, starting with May Hesse, the different kinds of analogies that are laid out there. That's already more difficult to understand as a kind of, a kind of concrete representation, because it doesn't involve a representation of a physical system by means of another physical system, but rather by means of some kind of conceptual schema. And we have to very selectively pick up the properties that are um, representational from those that are not. And then if you just go all the way mathematically into the realm of highly abstract mathematical models, uh, one that I've studied at length is the quantum state diffusion equation in, in quantum state diffusion theory, uh, which is one of my favorite approaches to quantum mechanics, where you have a very abstract mathematical equation that represents a very abstract kind of motion in a very abstract mathematical space that in turn is somehow related to physical motion in physical 3D space. So there's a kind of iteration of different representational spaces that go on. There, the mathematical equation represents only very indirectly, but very precisely um, the properties of, of quantum systems. So there's a sense in which only the first seems undeniably, we would say, representational because it's so concrete. The others uh, seem to be very abstract. And if you were about trying to capture that kind of distinction, you may think you could employ something like a resemblance theory. Um, what would explain these varying degrees of representation or abstraction? But well, maybe representation is all about finding similarities or resemblances. Something like this theory may, may appeal. If the A is the source of the representation, a painting in the case of artistic representation, a model in the case of scientific representation, then um, the resemblance theory would simply say that um, the source represents the target if and only if, and, or to the extent that the source resembles the target. And that seems quite intuitive. It works um, naturally in cases of artistic representation. It seems to work in cases of physical uh, representations by means of concrete models. But when you start thinking about the varying degrees of resemblance, that does not seem to capture the accuracy or the representational power um, of the different models. The mathematical model, the quantum state diffusion model, is extremely precise, while the concrete physical model with all the balls that you give to your kids is a lot more imprecise as a model of planetary motion. So um, whether this is a good guide to the accuracy of the representation are a good dispute. Um, at any rate, this is a theory that has by now been discarded. Many of us have criticized that um, it sort of conflates two distinct questions together that must be kept distinct. Uh, one is whether the source represents the target, and the other one is to what extent it is an accurate or faithful representation of the target. And the resemblance theory, which at best would provide a valuable guide to the second question, is actually hopeless as an answer to the first question for reasons that many of us in this room have explored at length um, for logical reasons, for um, reasons of variety, for reasons of necessary and sufficient conditions that fail in all these cases. So I think this is not a, a, an, an appropriate theory for scientific representation and not therefore a theory that we can use to understand, to link or to give an account of understanding as a kind of variety or version of representational success. Um, you may think, well, something like the denotation theory may work better, and um, people have tried with different kinds, kinds of cases of the denotation um, uh, relationship. 
Um, maybe a source represents a target if and only if it denotes it. Um, that's certainly not sufficient. Sophisticated denotation accounts for building a bunch of extra conditions into, into the definition. <coughs> um, well, this answers the first uh, question about representational targets, uh, appropriately in some cases, certainly in the cases of the physical concrete models. Um, uh, those models denote the target, therefore, Maybe they represent them. But it clearly it will not answer the second question very well because the notation is a yes no binary sort of term. Well, accuracy, as we've seen, come, it comes in degrees, so therefore it's not going to help us very much to answer that question. Moreover, it has a very important problem with fictional entities and the representation of fictional entities. And these are typical in art, but also in science. And I will argue in a minute that we have many of those cases, some of them again treated extensively in Hank's book. Um, the, note, uh, the, the notation is a success term, so A denotes B only if B is the real reference of A, but many models are not referential in this way. Most are highly idealized anyway and contain all kinds of different fictional assumptions, so this is not going to help us. Something like a functional uh, version of this theory may go a bit farther, um, and we could use the notion of the notative function, which have sort of um, um, picked up and developed from some ideas of Catherine Elgin. Um, maybe you could say that a, a source represents a target only if the source has the notative function for the target. This is not a success term because the source may have the notative function but fail to denote. Say a picture of a unicorn has the notative function towards unicorns but fails to denote unicorns because there are no unicorns in the world to be denoted. Um, but then, how do you characterize the notative function? This is not, again, an easy question. Um, people who work in, in logical characterizations and in metaphysical characterizations of this notions have come up with different um, definitions. Um, a purely logical characterization of the notative function would just say that a source has the notative function for a target. If and only if were the target to exist in the actual world, then the source would denote it. So the painting of the unicorn has an auditive function because were there to be unicorns in the actual world, that painting would denote them. <laughs> um, and then there are metaphysical renditions of this kind of definition where uh, this sorts of counterfactuals are understood by means of possible worlds. So then you would say that a source has the notative function for a target if and only if it denotes the target in the closest possible world where both the source and the target exist. Remember, Lewis, counterfactuals, and possible worlds. But of course, if we have to go all the way to this in order to understand scientific representation by models, and I think we, we, we've landed in a, in a really horrible, inhospitable, metaphysical um, <laughs> place. And so I prefer to stick with very basic um, logical characterizations of distance, and, and let's avoid the metaphysical complications. Something like the notative function must play a role in a good account of um, representation. This is roughly what I think could, could work. Um, uh, I've been defending that representation has an essential inferential component, but it may also have this denotative function component. So build both of those as, uh, as necessary conditions on, on what it means for some source to represent a target. And this goes a farther way in answering some of our problems. It answers the binary question correctly in all cases, because in all the cases of the models that I presented you with, the model, the model source has the notative function towards the target. As we will see, this also works in case of fictional representations, in which we have models representing non-existing entities akin to the unicorn uh, paintings. Um, it also answers questions of degree, the second types of questions, in terms of the second component of this um, account of representation in terms of the amount of reliable information that is transferred about the target on account of an inspection of the source. So models are always used um, when they're used representationally in, in, in ways that allow for surrogate inference about the targets on the basis of properties of the sources. And the sort of information that the model sources give us about the targets are precisely what allows us to characterize the accuracy of the representation. And I think that's the key to accurate representation and nothing like a resemblance relationship of any sort between sources and targets will do. And as you can imagine, reliable information from sources about targets are highly contextual notion. So that links in 
nicely with what Hank has to say about the contextual nature of understanding. What resemblance or similarity um, people have tried to understand as a kind of perceptual notion, therefore is slightly contextual, but it's much harder to understand in those terms than, say, the transmission of reliable information. I mentioned this accommodates fictional representation, and you may be wondering what do we need to care about this because there are no unicorns in science, um, and science doesn't go about more than unicorns, but it, it does sometimes. Um, this is Maxwell's vortex model of the ether, um, which Maxwell took to be a model of the ether. Um, he thought um, you could go about modeling it mechanically by supposing that there is this bunch of different um, vortexes that rotate in a given direction and therefore generate a number of um, electric and magnetic phenomena. But in order to make this description consistent, he had to introduce this counter-rotating little pulleys in between the vortexes. And this generated new phenomena, something called the displacement current, which he couldn't really interpret. Eventually, he postulated it, and lo and behold, you can experimentally find it, which is amazing, because this is a clearly highly idealized, not to say just false, model of uh, an entity in the ether that we nowadays think does not exist. So uh, how to get that kind of novel prediction for a model um, with this characteristics, of course, one wonderful episode in the history of science and deserves um, a long historical explanation. Um, so this is one of those models in which the model essentially represents what is a fictional entity. And you need to account for, for it representationally, and I think there is a good case to be made that the model is a representation, but on none of the standard kinds of representation that we go through, on the inferential account, on any deflationary account of representation it may go through. And so that's one of the main virtues I, I claim for the account, the minimal account of representation as, as uh, inference drawing. Of course, we nowadays have a more complex and mathematical description of electromagnetic phenomena in terms of Maxwell's equations. And so the question here is how are we going to go about um, studying the representational relationship that operates between these equations and electromagnetic phenomena? What kind of understanding does it give us of that phenomena? Well, you could try a kind of uh, equivalent resemblance theory of scientific representation. The two that have been discussed are the similarity and the isomorphism theories. And for reasons I already mentioned uh, before, we don't really think that any of these theories will, will do. So something like a denotative function version of um, Rick Hughes um, theory of the DDI account of representation may work. I know that Roman and James um, have developed a sophisticated account um, along these lines. Um, it will have to employ something like what I mentioned before, the notion of denotative function. Um, something like that may work, nothing like a resemblance account will work. What are the consequences of all this for understanding? Okay, so um, since I still have 10 minutes, um, I now want to come to the point that I want to make today, which concerns how to go about accounting for understanding on the basis of this notion of representation. So this is similar to what Christoph did um, a few hours Ago, but there are some significant differences between the way he was going about doing this and the way I like to do it. Um, so, what I want to argue, I want to put out this claim um, as a kind of um, conjecture. And uh, you will have to tell me um, if this may be in any way plausible. I find it plausible. Um, I think it chimes in well with some things that Hank does in the book, and there's a natural continuation of many of the things and themes that he raises in the book, although it's also different to what he does in the book because it does not depend on the idea that understanding always relies on background theory. So what I want to claim is that there is a sense of very basic scientific understanding that one gets only in virtue of providing a model for a phenomenon. So you can understand a phenomenon very basically just by providing a model for it. That in itself is sufficient for a minimal kind of understanding for a scientific phenomenon. So I, I'd like to defend something like this, that some model represents some phenomenon if the conditions for uh, representation obtain. 
and they are very minimal. They know that they function and informative inferences. Remember that these informative inferences need not be to true conclusions, and I'm not employing here a veridical account of information, rather a purely mathematical, reflationary account of information and information transmission. That's in Shannon's theory, but nothing that builds any kind of truth semantics into it. So the claim would be that understanding, which on this account is an activity, the activity of drawing inferences from source of targets, is um, just the it's just a matter of providing a model and, and representing by means of the model. The model need not be a particularly felicitous one, and it could include all kinds of idealizing and fictional assumptions. But nonetheless, that's already sufficient to provide us with a basic kind of understanding of the phenomenon. So another way to put this claim is to say that representing some phenomenon minimally by means of some uh, model source uh, already provides some understanding of that, um, of that model, of the target of the model in terms of the model source. And since I've not built into any conditions of activity or success into this notion of representation, the notion of understanding that comes out is similarly non-factive and does not require reference of success. So you can have perfectly good understanding of the ether provided by the mechanical model that Maxwell um, de develops. There's a sense in which that model already provides you with some basic minimal understanding of what? Of the ether. And on my account, these are all permissible ways of using the terminology because there's nothing in this theory of representation that, does, that comes into conflict with any of those um, terms. There's a very deflationary, highly contextual account of representation as a consequence of that. The account of understanding that piggybacks on it is similarly contextual and deflationary. So there's not, uh, so understanding on this account is not necessarily veridical and is not necessarily referential. It is just merely um, minimally representing by means of models. Now, this is kind of distinct to what um, Hank and Christoph was exploring um, earlier on today, um, because you could argue that there are more robust forms of understanding that do rely on theory. So you could maybe distinguish this from understanding by means of basic established theories. So I would say that the basic minimal account of understanding as providing a basic model representation of the phenomenon needs to be contrasted with more robust forms of understanding that do rely on established theory. So I say, for instance, perhaps, um, a model um, of some established theory, that is, a model that falls under the domain or it pertains to a particular theory, has been built by means of a particular theory represents a phenomenon in the domain of that theory, if and only if those conditions obtain. But of course, this is a stronger notion of understanding, um, because on this notion of understanding, the vehicle, the source, the model source that satisfies this condition, these conditions for representation, is also grounding the understanding upon some established theory. So, for instance, if you have a quantum mechanical model that is purely quantum mechanical of the motion of some electron or the, um, some of the features of an electron in a particular uh, cavity, you are just providing a model that is <coughs> an instance of the quantum mechanical theory and that model provides you understanding in terms of this established theory. But if you're providing a stellar structure model of the kinds of Phyllis was exploring before which depend and rely on a variety of different theories and occasionally on inconsistent theories, that model would not be relying on established theory in this way, it's not a model of the theory, therefore it's not going to be providing you with this very strong kind of um, explanatory understanding. So another way to put this claim is that a theoretical representation that is a model of a particular theory employed in order to represent a phenomenon um, constitutes an explanation, stronger term, of the phenomenon in terms of the theory. And this would be a kind of a stronger kind of understanding that, provide, that is provided by a theory. Moreover, since in the case of models, I think it makes little sense to speak of models as being true or false. At least most of us who work <coughs> on the topic of models have taught ourselves 
to think of the virtues of models in different ways and by means of different properties. But in the case of theories, I think it still it sort of makes a lot of sense to think of theories as being true or false. Then uh, you restore some kind of sense of veridical explanation by means of outcome like this, because then you could argue that whatever um, understanding is acquired of this very explanatory uh, <coughs> sort by means of a true theory is um, some kind of true explanation of the phenomenon. And that's how I would like to distinguish the cases that we were discussing earlier on today, the Copernican, the Ptolemaic, all those are false theories, of course, but, um, and I'm not sure the Copernican theory gives much more understanding than the Ptolemaic, but, um, but certainly if we had a true theory um, that described the, uh, the planetary motions um, very precisely and accurately, then uh, we could claim to have something like veridical understanding of that phenomenon via the means of that theory. Um, what I'm arguing here is that even when we don't have such true theories that give fully accurate accounts of their domains, we nonetheless have a lot of understanding via false, idealized, fictional models, what have you, as long as they're good in doing their representational work and allowing for good inference about their, um, their model um, targets. So that's, that's really it. I, I just conclude with those four, four theses that really summarize what I've said here today. Uh, I like to defend that scientific understanding is an instance of a more general kind of understanding as representation. That there's a type of activity involved in this, which is inferential. It's the drawing of inferences from the source of the targets. There's no uh, real distinction in kind between understanding and explaining on this account, other than reliance on established uh, theory. And as a consequence of this understanding in itself is neither factive nor veridical. Um, uh, although objective inferential norms and constraints will apply as they apply to every instance of representation. And those are, I think, some of the lessons that we can uh, pick up from, from Hank's work over the years, that the kind of understanding, if it's going to go some way, it has to um, not be factive and political or require those products in the way that we have. So that's what I want to say. Thank you very much.